The Blessed Eucharist, Our Greatest Treasure by Father Michael Mueller Chapter 2 On the Reverence Due to Jesus Christ in the Blessed Sacrament Rudolf, Count of Habsburg, whilst hunting on one day, observed a priest carrying the viaticum to the sick, whereupon he immediately alighted and insisted on the priest mounting in his place. The offer was accepted. The priest, having gone through his sacred and pastoral duty, returned the animal with many marks of gratitude to the count. But this noble and Christian count could not be prevailed upon to accept it. No, said he, keep it, for I am not worthy to ride upon a horse which, my, which has borne my lord. Whilst the Lutheran heresy was spreading its ravages throughout Germany, Charles V of Spain hastened to Augsburg to assist at the diet convened there to stem the pernicious influence of this heresy. The Feast of, Co Feast of Corpus Christi fell at that time. It was celebrated with every possible pomp and magnificence. The Emperor Charles insisted thereat with the most edifying devotion. At the procession, the Prince Bishop of Mayence carried the most adorable sacrament, being supported on the right by Ferdinand, the Roman king, on the left by Joachim, elector of Brandenburg. The canopy was borne by six princes, namely Louis, Duke of Bavaria, the son of the elector of Brandenburg, George, Duke of Pomerania, Philip, Count Palatine of Waldelberg, Henry, Duke of Brunswick, and the Duke of Mecklenburg. When these six princes had carried it as far as the chapel on Mount Burlock, six others took it and carried it to the place called the Holy Cross whence six others bore it to the cathedral. The Emperor Charles, torch in hand, on foot, and with uncovered head, accompanied by several archbishops, bishops, and many persons of high rank, followed the procession during the whole route. Such noble traits of devotion are not confined to days gone by. In our own times we see princes who have inherited from their fathers this true devotion to the most holy sacrament. Of the present, Emperor of Austria, it is related that one day as he was riding through the streets of Vienna, at the signal announcing that the Blessed Sacrament was being carried to the sick, he immediately stopped his carriage, alighted, and on bended knee, there devoutly adored his Lord and God. The same is said of that excellent princess, the late Queen of Belgium. Now these instances of reverence are not mentioned as being great in regard to the Blessed Sacrament. Before him who dwells, concealed under that veil, princes are as nothing. Why then should we be astonished at this? Why look on this tribute of devotion as something extraordinary? Tis true. These princes are as nothing before our Lord. 
But they are great and mighty when confronted with us, and may well serve to remind us of the obligation which faith imposes upon us. If then those whose position bespeak honor and ease cheerfully submit to humiliation, inconvenience, and pain at the call of religion, what ought we not to do? We cannot boast of high position to make us proud, luxury to make us effeminate, or gentle care to make us tender. On the contrary, our position bows us to humility. Our necessity and poverty bend us to labor. Our life accustoms us to forego our ease. This being the case, Whilst we honor the great ones of the earth, shall we refuse to join them with them in worshiping him who is the source of all greatness and who is above all? We have seen that reverence toward the blessed sacrament is enjoined upon us by faith and reason and preached to us by heaven and earth. I will then add but one more reflection. It is urged upon by us the teaching of our Holy Mother, the Church. To what tend all her beautiful cer ceremonial, her minute ritual, and her costly ornaments but to inspire or express reverence for the divine spouse. Why is the priest who celebrates mass and the faithful who receive communion required to be fasting, but on account of the greatness of the guest they are about to receive? The incense, the lights, the flowers, the vestments of the priest, the numerous attendants, the genuflections, are not all these to honor him who has so greatly humbled himself for the love of us? And not content with her daily homage, she has appointed a festival in the year for the express purpose of repairing the injuries which Jesus Christ has received from men, whether at the time of his invisible sojourn on earth or since the establishment of his religion, especially in the sacrament of his love. What is the possession of Corpus Christi but a reversal of the judgment which an unbelieving world passed upon our Lord and a compensation for the outrages which it, is inflicted on, it has inflicted on him? As he was once in the mid, the most ignominious manner, led as a malefactor through the streets of Jerusalem, from Annas to Cephas, to Cephas, from Cephas to Pilate, from Pilate to Herod, from one tribunal to another, so is he on this day born in triumph through the streets as the spotless Lamb of God and man's highest good. As his sufferings had no other witnesses than envious and mocking Jews, so now on this day every knee bends in adoration before him. As the executioners once led him forth to death, so in this procession, the great ones of the world mingle with the throng to do him reverence. As then his ears resound with the most scornful and outrageous blasphemies, so now on this great festival the church greets him with every kind of music, musical instrument and song of praise. The crown of thorns which once pierced his brow is now exchanged for the wreath of flowers around the remonstrance. 
while civil magistrates with their insignia and troops of heroes with glittering arms and waving banners placed the fierce Roman soldiers replaced the fierce Roman soldiers who once kept watch around his dark and silent tomb. The cross which Jesus bore with sorrow and sweat up the rugged, rugged hill of Calvary is on this his day of triumph, carried before all as the sign of victory. Jesus himself, who was lifted up upon it, is now in the Blessed Sacrament raised aloft in, to impart his benediction to his kneeling and adoring people. If such be the spirit of the Church, what should be the practice of her children? Are we Catholics? Where then is our faith? It is Jesus, our Savior, who remains enclosed in the tabernacle and who is lifted on high in the remonstrance. Remonstrance. It is the true eternal God whom we receive in communion. We must show by our works that we believe this. I do not say that we are bound as the early Christians, to prostrate ourselves to the earth and press our foreheads in the dust. I do not say that we are bound to imitate St. Vincent of Paul and bend the knee where it cost us the most excruciating pain to do so. Nevertheless, we are bound at least to avoid offending our Divine Lord and dishonoring him to his face. We are bound when about to receive Holy Communion, carefully to prepare ourselves by a good confession and thus avoid the dreadful peril of receiving him in a state of mortal sin. We are bound to lay aside all unbecoming attire and scandalous behavior, especially in the house of God, and to be modest, reverent, and humble in attitude and deportment. We ought to regard all our members as, in some way, consecrated to Jesus Christ, whom we so often receive, or at least whom we visit in the Church. It is not fitting that the feet which have borne us to the altar of God should carry us into evil company that those eyes which in the morning at Mass have looked upon the Immaculate Victim should through the day look at with that which is unclean, that the tongue which has been the throne of God should utter blasphemous, impure, or calumnious words, that the heart which has been united to the infinite purity and beauty should be polluted by the stain of sin. But alas, how often are such indecencies perpetuated? When one thinks of the offenses which Jesus Christ receives in this sacrament, of the sacrilegious communions which those make who receive in mortal sin, or in the proximate occasion of sin, of the neglect of so many to receive Holy Communion for a long time, and the insufficient preparation they do make when they receive, all this is enough to make the true Christian shudder with horror. Yes, we are inclined to believe, as of old, God repented that he had made man, because his heart was bent on, his, on wickedness. So now our Lord must surely repent of having instituted this sacrament and must even wish to take away from his priest the power which he gave them of consecrating his body and blood. But no, such a thought does an injustice to his love. Jesus Christ will never withdraw the power which he confided to his church of changing bread and wine into his most adorable body and blood. He will continue to suffer patiently and silently 
till the end of time for the sake of those faithful souls who give him pleasure by the devotion and love with which they receive or visit him. Let us seek to be of that number. Let us approach him with an upright heart and a lively faith. One day he will throw off his disguise and appear in his heavenly might and splendor. Oh, how happy will they be who have kept him company in his humiliation. They will not be confounded, but will stand before him with great constancy. They will see his face and rejoice forevermore.